God of peace, bless us abundantly during this Advent season, that we might be ready for the holy, for the coming of the nonviolent Jesus, that we might heed the message of John the Baptist and repent of our violence and complicity with systemic violence and injustice, that we might prepare a way in the wilderness for our nation for the nonviolent Jesus and help others as well. Renew our hope and our spirits that we can do our part to help end the hatred and war and racism and executions and poverty and nuclear weapons, environmental destruction, that our lives might bear the good fruit of justice and discernment. That we and all your children might welcome Jesus's Christmas gift of peace on earth. Amen. Amen. So again, a, a warm welcome to everybody. And Advent is such a beautiful time in this terrible time, you know, and all the terrible stuff happening this week with the pandemic and Trump and the executions. It's a season of prayer, preparation, repentance, renewal, hope, peace. Those are beautiful themes. And so I continue, I invite you as I did last week that this is what I'm trying to do is to make this a kind of at-home retreat time, to use this pandemic lockdown as a little retreat, a pilgrimage time as we prepare for Christmas. And so to so do some real deepening, more prayer time, journaling, reflecting on your life and how you wanna live the rest of your lives and to go and be with Jesus and prepare for the coming of Jesus. Next Sunday, we're gonna look at the, the great story of Mary as an advent journey of nonviolence. And then, as I said, if you wanted to, the following New Year's Day, we're gonna have a short little session about the starting the new year anew to make it, a, I'm thinking of it as like the year of living nonviolently, which I realize is a little over the top. But I, and I've been thinking that I wanna talk about that text from Luke where Jesus tells Peter they're in the boat, he's been teaching and he says, put out into deep waters which just kills me. What a phrase, put out into deep waters. And I think he's asking all of us to do that. So we'll talk about that on New Year's Day if you wanna sign up and register for that. And then we're gonna have a, a class on Martin Luther King. I think it's Saturday, January 16th on his letter from the Birmingham jail. Great. So John the Baptist, Jesus says, there's so much to talk about in my opinion. Jesus says at one point, he's the greatest person who ever lived. So we gotta look at him. He did a great job preparing a way for Jesus. So our general theme for today and for this week for you, I'm gonna give you lots of questions as I did last week and we're gonna look at three scriptures. The general theme might be, how have you during your life been preparing for the God of peace? For the coming of the nonviolent Jesus, for the coming of God's reign of peace. Throughout your life, that's what all of you have been doing. have been doing. But to look back on that as one way to think on your life. And from to this day and for the rest of your lives, how can we, how can you, like John the Baptist, prepare more and more a way for Jesus and help others in the world prepare for the nonviolent Jesus? That's why I talked about becoming more nonviolent. We're trying to get ready for the nonviolent Jesus and welcoming the God of peace into our hearts and our lives, which means God's reign of peace into the world, which means ending everything that's anti-reign, all violence and war and killing and so forth. His main message seems to be, get ready, start to prepare for the coming of the nonviolent Jesus. I don't know if you all remember, uh, or those of you from New Mexico saw, uh, that car that used to drive around in Santa Fe, <laughs> it had a, a bumper sticker and it uh, said, um, Jesus is coming, look busy, which I thought was pretty funny. Okay, you're not laughing at that, but maybe that's because you're all muted. I always thought John the Baptist was a mean, angry person. But over the years, I don't see him that way at all now. I think of him as, as a strong and gentle 
prophet of peace and nonviolence like Dr. King, Oscar Romero, and Daniel Berrigan. They were very strong, but very gentle prophets. So I want to read through passages about John the Baptist from Mark, Luke, and the Gospel of John. There's, I don't, we don't have time to even do a look at Matthew, but it's all basically the synoptics. And then I want to point out basic themes for each one. And then I'll offer some questions for your, your reflection and then take your questions and comments uh, through the chat. So I hope that sounds good. And just to remember, you know, note the nearest exit. Uh, there may be turbulence, so buckle your seat belts. The point is that this is supposed to be helpful. Uh, I'm just trying to encourage you uh, to do your inner work. And we're going to use John the Baptist and his story and life and message and teachings as a way for us to deepen uh, in peace and nonviolence, to become better disciples, more mature disciples of the nonviolent Jesus, better peacemakers. But if you get distracted or bored, no problem. Take out your journal as I'm talking, do some journaling about Advent. Or go in and read the text, get your Bibles. I, I, I put the texts in the chat room. You should find them at, if you scroll up there. This, you'll see the text that I'm going to be going through. Um, and, you know, reflect on your life and how you're doing during the pandemic and what you're going through and where God is coming to you. What has God been saying to you this week? Where's the Holy Spirit leading you? And as your coach, I'm just trying to encourage you to get in shape for Jesus. So, okay, so I'm gonna read you right now the two beginnings of the text about John the Baptist, one from the Gospel of Mark, one from the Gospel of Luke. You don't have to read along. You've got the text in your chat. The first is the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. So I just invite you to listen. It's Mark one verses one to nine. So here goes. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He fed on locusts and wild honey. And this is what he proclaimed. One mightier than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop and lo loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now I'm going to read you Luke's version, which is a little longer and more complicated. This is from the gospel of Luke, chapter 3, 1, verses 20. And it begins with all the specific time, uh, historical context. It's like saying, in the year, in the fourth year of Donald Trump's presidency during the pandemic, when McConnell, the word of God, came to Greta Thornburg. This is what we're going to kind of be hearing here. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius was Tetrarch of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. So he went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding road shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth 
and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And he said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce good fruits as evidence of your repentance. And don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these very stones. Even now the ax lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what should we do? And he said to them in reply, whoever has two coats should share with a person who has none. Whoever has food should do likewise. And the tax collectors came to be baptized and they said to him, teacher, what should we do? And he answered, stop collecting more than what is prescribed. And soldiers asked him, what is it that we should do? And he told them, do not practice extortion. Do not falsely accuse anyone. Be satisfied with your wages. Now all the people were filled with expectation, were asking in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. And John answered them all saying, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now exhorting them in many other ways, he preached good news to the people. Now Herod the Tetrarch, who had been censored by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the other evil deeds Herod had committed, added still another one to these by putting John in prison. So that's Luke chapter 3. So there's so many themes here to talk about in Mark and Luke's version. And what I'd like to do is walk through them and point out a few for your reflection. And then we're going to look at John, which kind of ups the ante and um, takes a different look on it all. I hope this is all okay so far and you're still hanging in there with me. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, say that he appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, calling everyone to repent. And the big crowds went out to the desert to see him, and they're all profoundly moved, and they all changed their lives. Whereas the mean religious authorities kept asking him, who are you? And in both cases, we're given the verse from Isaiah saying, I'm a messenger, a voice in the desert crying out, prepare a way for the Lord. Um, so my first thought was I was preparing for this. I, I thought, and I still think, I, and this is just for your reflection. These are just points for your reflection. I think the job of every Christian is to be a voice crying out. Prepare a way for the God of peace in a world of total permanent war and destruction. Prepare a way for the nonviolent Jesus in a world of total violence. We're calling for total nonviolence. We don't have to use the big word and say we are prophets. But we do have to speak out publicly. And, and notice how, as I said, the word of God comes to John in the desert, not to the rich and powerful, but to ordinary people like us, people of prayer, which is what we talked about last week, people who listen to God and hear God's word and discovers that it's a word about peace. And so we turn to the culture of violence and racism and war and destruction and we proclaim God's word of peace to the culture of war, like John the Baptist. That's our job description. And I learned this as a kid from Daniel Berrigan. I remember the very first day I met him, it was at Kirkridge uh, 37 years ago. And he said this one offline, uh, off the you know, cuff sentence to, there were only 20 of us there on a little retreat with him which just knocked the wind out of me. He said, it's not that we're political, it's that we're public, which was a huge revelation to me. It's not that we're political, we go public with our universal love, with the call to make peace and disarm, with the call to practice nonviolence and work for the coming of God's reign of nonviolence. And I, I don't like, 
public speaking, believe it or not, but it doesn't matter. It's part of my job description as a Christian. And so I invite you to reflect on this question. How have you done this during your life? How have you been a voice crying out, prepare a way for the God of peace? And I presume, because I know so many of you, that you all have done that. And to reflect on it, how well have you done it, with how much love and nonviolence, and how can you deepen more and more with the call to prepare a way like John the Baptist. And given the horrors of the world, this is what we need to be doing. Uh, to be announcing his way of peace and love and nonviolence to the world, beginning with the people around us, beginning with the church, our local communities, our peace groups to get, get the movement moving, all that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, that's why I'm doing it again with this little project to tell everyone that Jesus is totally nonviolent. We have to be nonviolent too and deepening in our nonviolence and especially Christians and Catholics who seem to be the problem in the world. Um, if you're not sure how to proceed, that's fine. Um, just keep going and listening to God in prayer. The God's teaching you about peace, love, and nonviolence, and then go and teach everybody what you hear, the word of God saying to you. As part of that, how do we prepare a way for the coming of nonviolent Jesus, the nonviolent Jesus? How are we doing that? You know, how are you doing it in your life right now? That's, a, that's the Advent question. And uh, again, we talked about that last week, spending more time in prayer with the God of peace, with Jesus, trying to work on our own nonviolence to deepen in gospel nonviolence, and trying to up the ante and get more involved in the grassroots movements of justice, disarmament, and creation. We, whatever you're doing, many of you are really busy people. We can still be more involved. I, I'm convinced there's a way to do that. Um, so that we're always preparing for the nonviolent Jesus. Even as the world gets worse, we go on preparing. So this next theme, John the Baptist calling us to repent, that's a big word. He proclaims, quote, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So uh, I don't know if my friend Bill Kellerman is on yet, uh, but he's written a lot of William Stringfellow, and maybe Bill, you, if you're there, you might have a question for us at the end or a reflection that would be great on Stringfellow's take. Because Stringfellow wrote a lot about Advent. Um, and Stringfellow said uh, that as baptized Christians, we are a permanent Advent people. Isn't that great? We're, we're in permanent Advent. And that means we're permanently repenting. We are a repentant people. We're constantly repenting, as opposed to going around being self-righteous hypocrites. Look how great I am. Thank you very much. Aren't I holy? That doesn't work. That's the point of the gospels. We're not trying, we're not doing them, constantly repenting. And so this word repent, as I understand, is from the Greek word metanoia, which means to turn around. Isn't that interesting? You are walking in one direction, going with the crowd, the whole world. But you and I waking up and turning around and going in the opposite direction. So the question is, as repenting people, what are we turning away from? And what are we turning to? What are we turning toward? These are my questions for you. And how's that going for you? I hear John saying to repent personally first our personal violence and sins, the way we hurt others, and becoming more people of nonviolence and love. And second, to repent nationally of the systemic violence, systemic injustice, and permanent warfare and racism, nuclear weapons, environmental destruction as North Americans, as people of the United States. We got a lot of repenting. We got to help our people repent. And third, globally, globally, as global, part of the human family, to repent of the way we've completely rejected the God of peace. We are all complicit in the world, in global violence, institutionalized injustice, permanent warfare, environmental destruction. There's no human being who's off the hook. As far as I think that's what John says. Um, so he's not just talking about personal sin, but social sin. The social, systemic, institutionalized sin 
of global violence and everyone is complicit. And we want to turn around from that mad rush to off the cliff and go in the opposite direction of everyone in the world, following John out into the desert and uh, on a new path of nonviolence and love and justice and peace and solidarity with the poor and creation toward the God of peace, toward a new culture of uh, justice and nonviolence. So for example, I remember out here in, in the locally in the parish on Ash Wednesday, I was preaching about this and I said, uh, I think all of us white people need to re repent and continue repenting for the rest of our lives for the sin of racism. And all of us men need to repent and to continue to repent for the rest of our lives for the sin of sexism. And anyone who has food and a house and healthcare and any money needs to repent of our wealth, especially in a world where 4 billion people suffer in extreme poverty. And the United Nations still says, looked it up yesterday, 25,000 people die every day of starvation, mainly children under five and starvation related diseases. So we need to repent of our part in wars, the existence of nuclear weapons and the terrible environmental destruction, the extinction of 6 million animal species. That incredible, I could go on and on and so could you. Uh, I was thinking of the death of John Lennon and Yoko Ono posted that message on Facebook that 1.4 million human beings have been shot and killed over the last 40 years since John Lennon was shot and killed. And if we haven't spoken out against these things, we have not taken action to stop this kind of systemic violence and injustice, no matter how small in our own ordinary ways, if we have remained indifferent toward the suffering and death of our sisters and brothers on the planet and the creatures and mother earth, we gotta wake up and change and repent and start speaking out and taking action. That's the message of John the Baptist, as you all know. So what are we gonna do about that? The John, uh, John says, uh, we want the God of peace to forgive us for allowing this global violence to continue. And um, so that if we want God to forgive us, we need to turn away from it and to resist it and to do our part to stop it. And that means we also have to forgive every person who ever hurt us. It's a total turnaround in our lives, calling for total nonviolence, total forgiveness, and total commitment to the human race and the coming of God's reign. Now, you're going, John, that's a little over the top. That's heavy, that's not much fun. That's sure very depressing. No, this is good news. That's why the gospel said it's good news. And if you don't like that, then look at, think of it this way. There's a very positive way of looking at repentance, which I find really helpful. And that's what Advent's about. And it's the flip side of all this. What are we turning toward? We know that we are turning away from the culture of violence, but what you and I wanna do is not only turn away from it and non cooperate with it and resist, you know, greed and war and hatred and racism, environmental destruction, all that horrible, the horror is going on. But we're also turning toward the nonviolent Jesus toward the God of peace more than ever. And that means, think of it, more than ever in our lives, from this day on, we are turning and opening ourselves toward universal love, universal compassion, universal justice for the poor, universal peace, heading toward total nonviolence. Isn't that fantastic? I think that's a project worth undertaking and a goal worth pursuing. That's the, that's the meaning of life right there. We're turning toward the nonviolent Jesus more and more and trying to walk in his footsteps more and more every day. And Advent's a time to, time to try to be really intentional about that, to really focus with all our hearts and lives and our prayers, especially during this lockdown, uh, to deepen and turn toward Jesus more and more. I think that's, that's what John the Baptist wants and so what's trying to tell us. And that's why everybody went to him and said, okay, you know, and they, they found that good news and were overwhelmed. So from this point of view, as we repent, we're not just focusing, saying on our personal feelings, but on the possibilities, the new possibilities, the new blessings of new life and love and peace 
and hope in Jesus as we turn toward him with all the social, economic, and political implications of that as we change and get ready and move closer toward him. Now, here's another very exciting part about all the passages I read, especially in Luke. I wonder if you noticed this. I'm sure you did. It's amazing. So once you meet John the Baptist, there's only one question. And everyone who goes out to meet him asks the same question. What can I do? What should we do? That's what everyone says. Okay, now what? What should I do? What should we do? And he starts telling them very specific things. If you've got extra food, give it to the poor. If you've got extra clothing, give it to the poor. Be just, be merciful, be honest, and so forth. That's how I interpret it. Uh, so I invite you to think, what would uh, John the Baptist say to you? If you were sitting down, maybe in your meditation this week, you might go off and take a walk with John the Baptist and say, okay, man, what do you want me to do? Or go and be with a nonviolent Jesus and say to him, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do? That's Advent. Uh, how do you want me to change? Where, where do you want me to go forward? And listen for an answer and write it down and then get to work. <laughs> So, okay, the next thing, notice the exact words of John the Baptist to the muckety mucks, the religious authorities are challenging him. Show the fruits of repentance. Produce good fruit in keeping with your repentance. Now, that's very powerful stuff. And as you recall, I got into that last week in the question and answer part with you. Um, someone was asking me about that. And I was saying it's not about results or being successful or even relevant as a disciple. We are a people whose lives bear good fruit for the God of peace. As we turn toward Jesus and deepen with Jesus, our lives bear good fruit. So that's my question for you. If, if John is saying, show the fruits of repentance, how has your life borne good fruit? Isn't that a great question? And each one of you have borne great fruit for God. Uh, and how do you, can you more and more continue to bear good fruit? Uh, what might that look like? John might say generosity toward the poor, working for justice, disarmament, uh, protecting creation, deepening in nonviolence, becoming a person of total nonviolence, resisting the systemic violence all around us, more time in prayer and meditation, your inner work, letting go of your selfishness, your pride, your fear and your anger, the roots of hatred and violence in you, whatever holds you back and surrendering more and more into unconditional universal love and compassion and peace. So this is a great grace to ask for the grace that you might bear more and more good fruit for the God of peace. Now, when we were talking about that last week, I think I quoted Merton's famous letter about that. Is the opposite of wanting to bear good fruit, which is slow, by the way. It takes a long time. You know, you got the seed, the seed's got to become a plant, and then it takes a while for a plant to bear good fruit. Sometimes it can take years, and then the fruit could be bad. You want it to be good, and you want, you're an activist, want to make a difference in the world, and you want tangible, immediate, visible results, and they never come. So you give up working for peace and justice. And you get frustrated. And Merton said that's a very grave temptation and misunderstanding of the life of nonviolence. So I wanted to pause for a moment and read Merton's famous letter to Jim Forrest just to help us all with this question of fruit versus results in our lives. Because Merton is just so profound and wise. If you think of it, he spent seven hours a day in prayer for 27 years. And along the way, he wrote 150 books. <laughs> so um, here's the famous quote from the famous letter. So I'm reading Merton's letter now. It's almost like a letter from John the Baptist to us. That's the way I hear it. Do not depend on the hope of results. When you have taken on the sort of work you have taken on, essentially an apostolic work, you may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even achieve no result at all, if not perhaps results opposite to what you expect. 
As you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the result, but on the value, the rightness, the truth of the work itself. That's so profound. All that you and I can ever hope for in terms of visible results, this is Merton, is that we will have perhaps contributed something to a clarification of Christian truth in this society. And as a result, a few more people may have got straight about doing some things and opened up to God and made some sense out of their lives, helping a few more to do the same. As for the big results, these are not in, our, in your hands or mine, but they can suddenly happen and we can share in them. But there is no point in building our lives around this personal satisfaction, which may be denied us. So the next step in the process, this is still Merton, is for you to see that your own thinking about what you are doing is critically important. In other words, how you think about your life work for justice and peace. Quote, back to Merton, all the good that you will do will come not from you, but from the fact that you have allowed yourself in the obedience of faith to be used by God and God's love. Isn't that just wonderful? We're instruments of God. It's not my work. It's God's work. Think of this, Merton, think of this more, and gradually you will be free from the need to try to prove yourself, and you can be more open to the power that will work through you without your knowing it. That's how the way it works. If you can get free from the domination of causes and your own ego and the rush for results, uh, just serve God's truth. You will be able to do more, and you won't be crushed by the inevitable disappointments. Wow. The real hope then, Merton concludes, is not in something we think we can do, but in God who is making something good out of it in some way we cannot see. If we can do God's will, we will be helping in this process, but we will not necessarily know about it all beforehand. Um, I just think that's just utterly profound. And I remember the first day I was with Dan Berrigan, on that retreat at Kirkridge, he read that letter to the group and said, well, that's something to meditate on for us for the rest of our lives. And Dan's translation, because I heard him talk about this for almost 40 years. We do the good because it's good. We do what's right because it's right. We work for the abolition of war and injustice and racism and nuclear weapons and the destruction environment because it's good and right and the will of God. And we seek God's reign of peace because that's what God, God wants. So we place our hope in God and leave the outcome to God and trust that the outcome is in better hands than ours. It's in God's hands, not our hands. And that's good news. That's so liberating. This is an ancient spiritual tradition and teaching. And it's in a lot of the world's religions, especially in Hinduism, and Gandhi wrote a lot about this from a Hindu perspective, which I really love, which we talked about. Instead of worrying about results, we give our lives for justice and peace in pursuit of God's reign. But we trust that God will use our efforts for God's greater purpose, and therefore that our lives will bear good fruit in God's time. Things like that. And that's like my heroes, as I've often said, are the abolitionists of old, who pursued the impossible dream of... Uh, working for the abolition of slavery. They were saying, what are you, crazy? Most of them never lived, lived to see their dream realized. Um, and it never would have happened if they haven't worked for it and pursued the vision and left the outcome to God's hands. But they never gave up. You have to be persistent in this work. That's how you bear good fruit. And another take on this whole question that John the Baptist raises about produce good fruits this all shows up later in the Gospel of John. When Remember at the, in the Last Supper discourse there where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and bear good fruit for God. So another way to remember our life's work here is we are a good branch on the eternal vine of Jesus. And because Jesus is working and living through our, us, our lives can bear good fruit. So concentrate on the love of others, the Gospel of John says and the blessings of creation and, and life, and just take heart knowing that you're part of the vine and God's salvific work is for a more peaceful world is happening through you, even though you may not see it. So um, 
I wanted to say one other thing about this because it's in uh, because it's just been so amazing to me. John the Baptist says, show the fruits of repentance and the people say, what are we to do? And so that's why I mentioned that I think a lot about young Greta Thunberg, who's become such a prophetic voice to the world, calling us to take action to fight, fight climate change. I hope you all know who I'm talking about. She was 16 in uh, Sweden, <laughs> and she, within weeks, mobilized millions and millions of school kids to go on strike on Fridays to demand the world take action for climate change. And uh, then she's ended up speaking in the UN and everywhere around the world and been a, a, a source of great inspiration. She's a prophetic voice. And here's her main statement in two sentences. Our house is on fire and we have to start acting as if the house is on fire because the house is on fire, unquote. It's amazing to take a child to tell the world this. If the world house is on fire, you have to get out of your comfort zone and start taking action. So we should all be asking, what should we do? Uh, now imagine if your house was on fire. I have a friend whose house burned down in Santa Cruz two or three months ago, and he's been living in, and his wife and hotels and relatives and all. Your whole life is disrupted. But if the house is on fire, you don't sit there watching TV. You get up and you get your spouse and your kids and the dog and the cat and you run outside or you put the fire out. Or if you're outside, you put the hose on the roof. You know, your, your, your life is disrupted. You have to take action. So I wanted to tell a little story here about, of all people, Jane Fonda. The, act, the famous actors who, who she read a year and a half ago, not even that, Naomi Klein's new book, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. And she was totally shaken about it. And the long opening chapters there about Greta Thornburg, and she said, I have to change my life. Now, she's 81 at the time. And she said, I'm moving to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to get arrested every Friday until at the U.S. Congress until we really take action. And she launched the Fire Drill Fridays movement and started getting arrested, as you may remember, last fall, every Friday at the US Capitol. Now, a year ago, right about now, on Jane's 82nd birthday, my friends, and I think two of you are here on the, the Zoom, Brad from Lancaster and Michelle from Washington, DC. If you're waving, wave. I called them and made them come to DC and get arrested with me. Thank you, Brad and Michelle. And we had the best time. There were a thousand of us at the rally with Jane Fonda. We marched to the Hart Senate office building where Jane and Brad and Michelle and me and Reverend Barber and 140 of us one year ago were arrested for sitting in and jailed throughout the afternoon and released that night. And I think it was an experience at least, and I will speak for Brad and Michelle, a perfect joy was totally life-changing, it was thrilling, and it was a great action. In February, I went down, this was all before the pandemic, of course, I went to LA, where another thousand people gathered at the city hall there for a rally and march and action. And Jane gave this incredible speech saying, we have 10 years, 2030, to stop the drilling for fossil fuels. That's what all the science says and then gradually close out all our wells and end all our drilling. That's the key. In some places, she's been railing against Governor Newsom of California uh, saying, okay, you started alternative solar and wind energy, and that's good, but that's only half the task. You have to stop drilling and digging up the fossil fuels, carbon and coal, by 2030, or we were doomed, and this cat catastrophic climate change is gonna come so unhinged uh, many times beyond the Paris Accords, but, but we still have nine years. Uh, and the best way to do that is through movements. The only way positive social change comes about is a bottom up people power grassroots movement of creative nonviolence. That's what Jesus shows us to Gandhi and Dr. King. But what we need right now is the largest global grassroots bottom up people power movement of nonviolence in, his, in history to stop climate change. Now this is a John the Baptist kind of talk. So on top of all this, and I've been in touch a lot with Jane 
she publishes this book about it. And I want to make sure you can all see it. Because I remember out here, I went to the store and bought it. And look at the title. What can I do? Hello? Can you, did I, can you hear me? Nod your head. Does that sound like the gospel? Once you meet John the Baptist, your first question is, what can I do? The subtitle, My Path from Climate Despair to Action. And it's a really darn expensive book full of pictures and all the hundreds and hundreds of people who spoke. There's a picture of Brad, Michelle, and I, the top of our heads, getting arrested with Jane. And it's shocking book because it tells her story and it's a call to action about, uh, you know, getting involved in the movement. And one thing you all could do is, is join Fire Drill Fridays. She's still doing zooms periodically on Fridays and getting over a million people uh, listening in and I'm very inspired by her transformation and call and my other friends are uh, that I've been talking to her and I love that the title of her book is what can I do uh, it's it's like Jesus what do you want me to do and there's things we can do so that's just a footnote okay I hope you're all hanging in here with me because I'm now moving on more to the Gospel of John. Now I'm going to read you a long passage, point out a few things, give you a few concluding questions, and then we'll open it up for your questions. So this is from the Gospel of John. Now, Gospel of John, I always say, is written, could have been 50 years later after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it always says things differently. So I put the, the text in uh in your chat, but you you could open up the Gospel of John and just start reading the parts about John the Baptist if you want, and just sit with it. What words strike you and touch you? So I'm reading sections from the Gospel of John, chapter one, chapter three, and chapter five. Little mentions of John the Baptist. I'm, I'm putting them all together. So I invite you to listen to the Gospel of John. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. John testified to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth come through Jesus. Uh, and, and this is the testimony of John. Now, when the Judeans from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him, they asked him, who are you? And he admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Messiah. So they asked him, well, who are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said, well, who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord, as the Isaiah the prophet said. And some of the Pharisees were also sent, and they said to him, well, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. But there's one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who's coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him. But the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. And he said further, I saw the spirit come down like a dove from the sky and remain upon him. I did not know him. I didn't know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, on whomever you see the spirit come down and remain, he's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so I have seen and testified that he is the beloved of God. And the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And he, as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, behold, look, the Lamb of God. 
Well, then a dispute arose, of course, between the disciples of John and one of the Judeans about ceremonial washings. And so they came to John and said to, to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan to whom you testified is baptizing and everyone is coming to him now. And John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but that I was sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. This is so interesting. The best man who stands and listens to him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made complete. He must increase, I must decrease. And later in chapter five, here's a quote from Jesus. This is Jesus now. You sent emissaries to John and he testified to the truth. I don't accept testimony from any human being, but I say this so that you may be saved. John the Baptist, now this is Jesus talk. John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp. And for a while you were content to rejoice in his life. But I have testimony greater than John. The works that the Father that God gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform testify on my behalf that the God of peace has sent me. Moreover, the God of peace has sent me, who sent me, has testified on my behalf. Well, that's my text that I just wanted to point a few things out from the Gospel of John, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, we're told right at the beginning that John comes, quote, the word is for testimony to testify to the light. That's our job description, friends. Testimony. What does that mean? You're on the witness stand for your entire life. You're in a courtroom before a judge and you're giving testimony to what you saw. And you spend your whole life as a witness on the witness stand telling the world what you know and saw about the nonviolent Jesus, about peace, justice, and gospel nonviolence. I love that. But my question is, how have you tried to do that? And I've literally tried to do that, being in court for civil disobedience against war and injustice. Um, another question, he says here that John is here to testify to the light, which is wonderful. That's just what we need, because we're in a world of total darkness. We can't see. Imagine you, know, you get up in the middle of the, the night and their house is totally dark. And you're walking around, you walk into the walls and the furniture and you hurt yourself. That's what's happening to the whole world. That Jesus is the light of the world and John testifies to the light. And that's what we're trying to do too. So how have you given testimony during your life? And how can you give testimony for the rest of your life? And how can you testify to the light of the non violent Jesus? Patience, I was thinking, you know, another amazing thing to me is compared to people in the world or religious leaders, John does not announce himself. He's not an egotist or a megalomaniac or a narcissist or like Trump. He's actually not talking about himself or pointing attention to himself. He's not even talking about the emperor, the empire, the president of the government. He's saying someone greater is com coming. In fact, he actually is quite humble. Um, he's almost, he keeps telling us, it's been really important. He says about six times, I didn't recognize Jesus. I didn't see him. I didn't know. No, I didn't get it at first. It took me a while. And I could talk more about that if you want. That's very humble to me. His intention is entirely focused on Jesus. And I think that's how we can be too. Uh, and I, so I love how he told his disciples, look over there, behold the Lamb of God. He points to the nonviolent Jesus and describes Jesus as infinitely gentle, as gentle as a lamb. Talk about pointing to the nonviolent Jesus. And everybody thinks Jesus is violent and God is war making. It, it is right there. That would be enough to go on for the rest of our lives. God sends us a lamb to lead us. And so they run off and follow Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We want to help others see the nonviolent Jesus in our midst and to point out the presence of the nonviolent Jesus in our world, 
you know, among the poor, in the struggle for justice, in the movements of nonviolence. And uh, so the attention is not on ourselves, friends. This is not about me. This is not about all I'm doing, how holy or great I am. It's the complete opposite of that. And that's one of the great traps of the religious life. But then what's so fantastic is the last thing I think I'm going to talk about is John tells us that he listens for the voice of Jesus. And when he hears Jesus, his joy is complete. That's just a fantastic statement. Um, it's an, an image from the early church. Remember that it runs throughout the, the, uh, the New Testament that heaven is an eternal wedding banquet of joy and love. Everyone is reconciled and celebrating Christ and all that God has done for us. And in effect, that the early church was called, they called themselves the bride. And Christ is the bridegroom. Or you could say the whole human race is the bride of Christ. And John the Baptist says, I'm the best man at the eternal wedding banquet. I'm the bridegroom's friend. Think about what a best man is. It's usually the best friend of the best friend of the groom. And the best man stands right next to the groom. So John the Baptist is standing right next to Jesus, and he's listening for him. And he says he hears his voice. And he's filled, filled with joy. And this incredible sentence, my joy is complete. So I'm going to ask you about that. And the next thing is, therefore, so I, he must go grow greater and I must grow less. Well, can you say that? Is your joy complete? Um, I love this, this part about John that we never hear about that we too are listening for the voice of our friend, Jesus. We too are going to be at the eternal wedding banquet. We're there now in your prayer. And we're listening this Advent for the voice of Jesus. And we hear his voice, so we rejoice. And remember that in John's gospel, the gospel brings this up in John 15 at the Last Supper discourse. The night before Jesus is killed, he says, as God the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you this, so that my joy might be you in you and your joy may be complete. So this is my commandment, love one another as I loved you. So the Gospel of John says, John the Baptist, before he's arrested, experienced complete joy through Jesus. And then the gospel goes on and says, Jesus is saying, that's the calling of every one of us. Complete joy. I love that. And that works for me, friends. And I, 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 I know you know I've met a lot of the great saints of the modern era, and I think they did incredible things. And they were people of great grief, but they were also people of great joy. And I'm going to name the ones I knew and loved. Daniel Berrigan, Mother Teresa, Dom Helder Camera, Francisca Jägerstatter, Archbishop Tutu, and I would include Thich Nhat Hanh in that. These are people of incredible joy. They had something I, very few other people had. I think of the refugees in El Salvador that I knew. They were people of, an, of incredible joy, too. And they were prophetic people and struggling, but they had something. And they could say that to, and they did say to me that they had complete joy. So that's why I know this is possible to work for justice and peace, no matter what, to listen for Jesus, to stand by him as his friend, and to open up into Advent joy. So here's my closing questions, and I'll look to your questions. What about John the Baptist's life and message inspires you or challenges you? How have you prepared a way for the God of peace as carrying on the ministry of John the Baptist? And how can you continue to do that? Where do you need to repent? You know, in terms of turning around from participating or, you know, being apathetic in the face of the social sin of the culture of violence and war and so forth. 
and walk closer and closer, turn toward the nonviolent Jesus and the coming of peace in earth. How do you stand by Jesus? How are you listening to his voice? And how are you on your life journey moving into complete joy? Despite the world, John the Baptist is facing, he's going to be arrested and beheaded, and he's talking about complete joy. Now, this is, this is very important. And how are you going to increase and help the nonviolent Jesus? I'm sorry, how are you going to decrease more and more and help the nonviolent Jesus increase more and more? Those are my questions for you, and uh, I'm sticking to them. Mm-hmm.